Hello everyone. Welcome back to the second and last session on the, this webinar on monitoring coastal and estuarine water quality using remote sensing and in situ data. We're going to use two softwares, CDAS and Ocean Color Science Software or OCSSW. You must have used CDAS um, in last week's exercise. We'll continue to use that and we will use OCSSW through CDAS GUI. You must have installed OCSSW on your computers uh, through the instruction available through our set website. But if not, you will have time uh, in the during the lab time when we work on exercise two today to install OCSSW. So today we will focus more on comparing um, in situ and remote sensing data and go through procedures for developing algorithms. The homework assignment is posted on the website. Uh, it's due on 5th of January. Um, please note that uh, you will be answering questions using Google Form, but you will also submitting a couple of images from exercise one and exercise two to our set email. So here's the address given at this link. Those of you have attended both the webinars and complete the homework by the deadline will receive a certificate of completion uh, in after a couple of months after the webinar is over. We'll start with a very brief overview of session one and exercise one, and we'll go right to demonstrations. Uh, we'll first look at uh, chlorophyll A concentration derived from Modis and Weirs and compare with in situ data from CBAS and GQs. Then we will go through procedure for developing algorithm for deriving water quality parameters. Again, we will focus on Gulf of Mexico region and we'll focus on chlorophyll A concentration. Then we will have lab time when you will be working through exercise two. The exercise is already available um, and you can download that from the meeting page or from the website. So here's the review for last week. Um, we talked about water quality parameters uh, from remote sensing observations, how to derive them. So for that, we need satellite reflectance data or a water body. We got that Modis and Weir's data um, from NASA Ocean Color Web. We also got in situ observations from CBAS and GQs. Today, we are going to focus on this part. Uh, we'll talk some about atmospheric correction and about statistical or empirical algorithm development. We will also validate chlorophyll A concentration from Modis and Weirs with CBAS data. And we went through a number of steps already. We have picked Gulf of Mexico as our case study region. We located in situ water quality parameters uh, from CBAS and also independent data from GQs. Uh, specially and temporarily co-located with satellite overpass. We picked images uh, for the same day when we have in situ data. And we also looked for cloud-free images for those days when we have in situ data. We did not look at seasonal to annual coverage of in situ and satellite long time series of data. Today, we will see examples of looking at multiple days from remote sensing and in situ data. But we'll focus on analysis and statistical algorithm coefficient derivations uh, from in situ and remote sensing observations. We looked at CBAS site, how to select temporal and uh, special domain and download data. Uh, we also looked at uh, GQ's site, how to get data from that. Uh, more importantly, we went over CBAS file format. Uh, any in situ data that you want to read using CDAS, they have to be in this specific format where you have a header and data, there are two sections. Uh, there is delimiter that you have to specify and fields and units uh, for the data and then the data themselves are listed in text format as shown in this file. Then we um, started CDAS GUI and imported Modis and Weir's chlorophyll A concentration images and also imported CBAS and GQ's in situ data. Uh, we really focused on single day. 
where I focused on, for my demonstration, I focused on 26th of October 2013 and for exercise 1, you focused on 11th October 2017. Um, this is just one day and just a few points are there, but it gives us um, understanding and steps of all the procedure that's required without really looking at a lot of data. Um, it just kind of guides us through the procedure of how to look at this data in CDAS and today we'll focus on how to compare them. We looked at NASA Worldview and NOAA um, Ocean Color uh, website uh, where we learned how to monitor cloud-free images where there are in-situ data available. Uh, and then download Modis and Weir's level two data, uh, chlorophyll A concentration and other parameters from NASA Ocean Color Web. We picked Gulf of Mexico as a region, uh, selected days, sensors, and then uh, looked at different swaths. And we picked swaths and downloaded uh, Ocean Color files. Now, if you want to download bulk data, then here's the procedure we covered in last webinar. You can have all the years and all the days and um, global data, and you can bulk download that. For this webinar, we're focusing on just a few days because the focus is on learning procedure. And with that, we're going to start with our demonstration. The first one will be to compare chlorophyll A derived from CBAS uh, with MODIS and VIRS. And for my demonstration, I will stick to the same date for this part, uh, 26th of October, 2013. And later on, we will look at multiple days. After that, we are going to have a demonstration of how to uh, develop algorithm for chlorophyll A concentration uh, derivation from remote sensing and in situ data. So the focus will be on procedure rather than uh, analyzing a lot of data. So we'll go through the demonstration first, and then you will be repeating some of the same steps in your exercise two today. So let's just compare remote sensing chlorophyll A data with in situ data. And for that, I'm going to use the same day that I used last week for exercise or demonstration, that is 26th of October, 2013. Uh, if you recall, uh, for Gulf of Mexico, we had multiple swaths for this day. And so we had mosaic both Mo MODIS and VIRS data and saved those files last week. So in the CDAS, I opened that, uh, go, went to this open product, navigated to where the files were and then just uh, imported them in CDAS here. So if I go to MODIS band chlorophyll A data, uh, here's the map. Uh, this is chlorophyll A. Also see that CBAS data for this day and GQ's data that I had imported last week, they are also in here. Uh, you can zoom in and see. So here is CBAS data. So let's compare CBAS data with MODIS data, uh, chlorophyll data. So for that, uh, two things to keep in mind. First of all, these are point measurements, the in situ data are, whereas MODIS data are one kilometer resolution, VIRS data are 750 meter resolution. So it's, it's not like a fair comparison in the sense that we cannot expect that uh, chlorophyll data from remote sensing and in situ, they will match exactly. But this gives us overall statistical idea of how, what the relationship between satellite data and in situ data are. So in our region of interest, we can um, adjust satellite data to take care of that uh, locally. Uh, and so for that, uh, some quantitative comparison has to be done and there is a way to do it. So if you go here next to this symbol, uh, two arrows and this plot is there, it's correlative plot. You can click on correlative plot. And here, let's look at uh, this panel. So here we have point data is the CBAS file for the same day. Uh, data field we've chosen is chlorophyll and this is y-axis that is uh, MODIS chlorophyll A concentration. Here we've chosen box size of 3. We can have 1 
but three is better statistically because sometimes there is no exact match between uh, pixel location and in situ data location. If we have a box, then in situ data appearing in that box, that probability is much larger. So uh, one can take three by three. So the points here are mean of three by three uh, pixels. And this shows the range in each of that box. So you can also show regression line. So that's the green line. And this is the relationship with, with R square being 0.6 in this case. And so this tells us that, of course, uh, MODIS data have much higher value than in situ data. But then again, it, it is expected that, you know, this is much larger domain that we are looking at. It, one thing to, to be very uh, cautious about is that here we are just looking at the procedure, how to do the comparison. We just have one day and a few points. So what we find here is not really statistically very significant. We need many more points, many more days um, to derive this relationship and then it's um, more statistically significant give, and gives us idea of how satellite data are related to in situ data. But this is the way to compare the data. Uh, we can do the same with GQ's data, although we just have two valid points there. And so it hardly matters if we take three by three, um, you can see how uh, this relationship changes. And uh, there's just two points, but it shows how you can compare. Again, let's go back to the CBAS data as we have more points. One thing to notice here, if you go to this table view, click here, then you can get actual numerical values. So this is uh, co-located satellite data in three by three box with in situ data. If you uh, right click on this and copy this, you can paste it in a spreadsheet uh, such as Excel or OpenOffice. And then for multiple days, you can keep accumulating uh, co-located data to do more statistically significant um, or relevant analysis. So that's the uh, way to do actual analysis, but this just shows what features can be used in CDAS to, to compare remote sensing and in situ data. So uh, we can do the same with uh, VIRS data here. Uh, go to chlorophyll A. Again, here also you can see CBAS data and GQ's data. And we can do the same thing. Uh, we can go look at correlative plot. Uh, here again, it's table view, or this is a point view. Okay. And here we can see that relationship uh, R squared is smaller, and uh, much bigger differences between VIRS data and in situ data. So um, again, this is um, to show that how you can compare this data. Uh, we can have more days and then uh, we can derive this relationship which is more significant. So uh, this concludes the first part of the demonstration where we see how um, remote sensing and in-situ data can be compared and relationship between them can be found. So next, what we want to do is derive our own level two data from remote sensing level one data. We, last week, what we did was we downloaded ocean color level two data from MODIS and VIRS. Um, that was already derived. Today, we want to start with level one A and derive our own level two data. And why is it we are doing that? Because when you are dealing with your own uh, region of interest, um, you may want to derive your level two data with uh, revised options and we will go through that process. Uh, also look at here, this is Weir's image, all the coastal region, because they are partially land covered, they are usually missing and these, there are no water quality data derived here from um, say MODIS or Weir's. So can we do something about that if we change some option and get uh, some values here 
uh, level 2 data uh, derived from level 1. Uh, we also talked about atmospheric correction which is really a very important point and uh, atmospheric correction uh, changes with different areas because atmospheric aerosol and cloud uh, characteristics are different and so if we have flexibility to derive level 2 data we can adjust that for our own region so that's why this procedure is important and so we're going to do that I'm going to close this uh, product here for now and start with level 1 data for level 1 data also we can use the NASA ocean color web that we used last time here we don't want to look at entire Gulf of Mexico because we already know that in situ data are very close to coastal Florida in Gulf of Mexico. So I have chosen latitude longitude points based on uh, GQs and CBAS data uh, availability. Uh, and I'm also focusing on the same day that I have on 26th of October and Modis and Weirs. And we can find swaths. And here you can see that uh, this is Weir's data, this is Bodhi's data. And we, you can click on this file. Last time we downloaded level 2 OC files. Today we are going to download level 1 data. And I have already done so for both Bodhi's and uh, Weir's. So this is uh, Bodhi's data. It's in zipped format, it's compressed, so you can double click and then it, it uh, unzips or uncompresses. And real data are already in NetCDF format. So once we have these level 1 data, we want to see how we can go to uh, level 2 data. So for that, we need the CDAS OCSSW. Okay, now this file is uncompressed. So we can start with MODIS level 1 data. First, we want to geolocate the data. And so, we so from OCSSW, uh, we start with MODIS geo and have input file, which is this level 1A file. And here you can see that it populates this geo file. When you run this, it creates this geo file. It takes a few minutes and I already have uh, saved this geo file for MODIS so our use but this is basically what you do just get a level 1a file in here and then run this. Once you have both level 1a and geo file next step is to get level 1b and this is also where you can uh, get uh, level 1a as input and it also puts geo file in here uh, once you do that you can run this and level 1b file is produced not only just one but there are three level 1b files this is a half kilometer and this is quarter kilometer so you will see all these three files once you run this Finally, when this is done, we can do level 2 processing, which gives us geophysical parameters. So we go to CDAS and we use L2 gen, or this is level 2 generation, and this window opens. Now here there are many options. Uh, you can get, uh, first of all, let's get the file in. Uh, now we will have L1B LAC is our input here. That's what will be converted to level 2 data. So now here, if this is L1B, this is geo file, geolocation file, and output will be level 2 ocean color file. Um, so similar to what we downloaded from uh, NASA uh, ocean color web. Uh, you can get ancillary data. This is for atmospheric correction if you are going to do it. Uh, look at the products here. We have radiances and reflectances. So these are uh, water living uh, reflectances. We want them all, but we don't don't have to look at all infrared now. We can just look at 
uh, optical and near infrared data. Uh, if you look at derived geophysical parameters, all of these are default, including chlorophyll A. Let's just leave that as default. If you go to processing option, here is where a uh, number of things we want to look at. First of all, uh, this is AER opt is the atmospheric correction um, and there are multiple options. Uh, depending on which region you are in, you can try uh, different options and see which works the best in the region that you are concerned with or sometimes it's a turbid water, uh, especially if there are lakes or coastal region, uh, atmospheric correction might introduce more error. Uh, so sometimes um, no aerosol subtraction is also chosen. That's what we want to choose now. Um, so we're going to do this extreme options and see what we get. Scroll down here, leave all these uh, different wavelengths for different thresholds the way they are. But here what we're going to do is mask this highlight or saturated uh, uh, radiance that we want to mask cloud, mask land. Let's not mask any of these. Also, if you go down here, it says proc ocean. You can choose that, okay, force all pixels to be processed as ocean. This is what we are doing just to see whether we can get all that coastal region which was previously blocked, it was uh, considered land. Uh, and uh, so if we force it to be ocean, maybe we get a few useful pixels in that coastal region. So we're trying to do that. Uh, and then you can run. And it takes a few minutes, but you will get level two file. So once it is done, you will get a notice that it is complete and you will see this L2 OC file. Uh, you can open that. So and you will see in, in the file manager, um, the, go to view tool windows and file manager and it shows uh, this level 2 file. All the derived uh, data are here. And this is chlorophyll A uh, map that is shown here. Now you can see that everything is treated as ocean. So no land is must. So we have all this region, if you zoom in, uh, you see this, uh, everything where you have some data. So that is one way uh, to to deal with that uh, missing data because of coastal region. Now, these data are still in satellite projections, so we need to change protection of uh, this file, uh, and it should be in geographical protection, WGS84. I can say run, and it creates a reprojected file, which is what uh, we have to work with. When, when we actually compare it in situ data. So now we have the reprojected file here and we can open chlorophyll A data here. Now it looks uh, more geographically um, proper shape than before. Um, and one thing you can do is you can look at this mask manager and if you now you go back and say this high saturated radiance if you if you turn that on what it does is it essentially masks um, regions where uh, the clouds and and land so what although everything is treated at ocean you have masked that and you have still managed to look at this coastal region where there are less data missing now you can see this region where you have data now. So um, when you have your own level one to level two conversion, you can customize, this, customize it for your own region. 
um, and uh, compare with EC2 data. So you will be working with uh, this uh, for your own data in exercise 2 uh, at the end of the demonstration. So working with this reprojected at level 2 chlorophyll data from MODIS, I've imported this CBAS and GQ's EC2 data back in here uh, to compare. Uh, if you go to correlative plot again, uh, this is CBAS. Um, what you can see is that uh, compared to earlier uh, when I was using level 2 data from uh, Ocean Color Web, which I downloaded, uh, there were biases significantly larger compared in between um, satellite and in situ data. Now you can see that biases have gone down. R square also has gone a little down, but the range uh, that we saw that has decreased uh, in, in the box. Similarly, if you look at GQ's data, uh, now we can see that earlier we just had two points because other points, GQ's points were in the location where MODIS did not have any data because it was in coastal zone and it was treated as land. So uh, here we have at least a few more points. So the idea here is that you can generate your own um, level 2 data uh, and if you go to again level 2 gen there are several uh, options you can change here uh, for atmospheric correction you can set different masks and see how it works in your own region there are also thresholds that you can choose uh, zenith angle solar zenith angle and satellite zenith angle what are the ranges uh, you can work with um, what which wavelength to use for discriminating clouds and what kind of threshold for reflectance for that all these can be changed and uh, level 2 data can be customized for your own region for better uh, comparison with in situ data and then that's the scheme you use then. So this ends uh, the demonstration of OCSSW and generating level 2 data for your own region. So next we want to see is that can we derive um, algorithm based on in situ data and remote sensing data to derive chlorophyll A concentration. And before we start that, here is the documentation on NASA Ocean Color Web. Uh, this is the uh, from document, this is algorithm description. And if you go to uh, chlorophyll algorithm uh, for MODIS, it's given here, it's a fourth order polynomial. For low values, a color index also is used. But can we derive these coefficients based on remote sensing and in situ data? That's what we want to learn for our own region. So to do that, I've chosen a, a few days in October 2013. Uh, I've chosen uh, more or less cloud-free areas where we have GQ's data. So the idea is that if in your own region, if you have in situ data, you can find images where you have cloud-free data and then try and uh, co-locate them and then derive coefficients. So if using a few days, I'm going to demonstrate how we can do that. So let's start with one day. Here we're going to work with reflectance data. Again, going back to the document, this uh, term here is the ratio of reflectances in blue and green wavelength. Uh, and log 10 of that. So logarithm of chlorophyll is this. So what we want to do is we have reflectances here. We'll, we'll be using 443 and uh, 547, so blue and green. Uh, can we come up with that term here? And for that, we're going to use uh, raster data, raster and math band. Uh, we are going to go to uh, we can name this here and say RBG1, uh, say blue green, reflectance blue green one. You can edit expression. And we know that it's a uh, log 10. So here in function, we have log 10. So we can go to log 10. Here we have a ratio. So we can. Choose that. 
and this is now blue wavelength reflectance and this is green wavelength reflectance so now we have logarithm of that and we can say okay okay and you can see that this is the uh, log 10 uh, and the reflectance that shows up here now what we're going to do is again go back and get in situ data from C, uh, G who's here uh, so So here's the GQs data for this particular day and we can do the same thing, find correlative plot and um, look at chlorophyll and look at table. And here what we can do is copy this in Excel file. So this is from uh, remote sensing, this is the blue-green ratio and this is in C2 chlorophyll. So I have actually done that for all the modest days I have. Uh, I'm going to share that with you. So here are the data I picked from about six days or so. So this is uh, log of um, remote sensing reflectance ratio and this is chlorophyll and I've taken log 10 of that. So now we have these two terms. We are going to make our um, remote sensing data our x-axis and uh, log of in situ data our y-axis. So the idea is that um, we derive in situ data based on remote sensing data and those coefficients then we can use um, in future uh, when we have more satellite data we can use the same coefficients to generate uh, chlorophyll data. So here uh, we can insert a chart, make a scatter plot. So, so here is the here's the plot between remote sensing and in situ data. You can go to chart design, add chart element, trend line, and more trend line options. Here uh, the linear uh, line is fitted, but we know that we want a fourth order polynomial. So we can go to polynomial, increase it to 4, and we can also say uh, display equation and display R. Uh, so this, you can change font, so we can read that a little easier. Okay. So this is the equation we got, uh, as you can see. Uh, these are the coefficients and this is R square and this is fitted here. So uh, this is the way to do it. Again, um, we don't have enough samples to consider this statistically significant. In, ideally, you will be taking you will be taking hundreds of points um, distributed over uh, different seasons. And so then uh, you can find these coefficients that you can use for future uh, along with uh, future satellite data. So once you derive these coefficients, you keep them as your model coefficients. And as new satellite data come in, uh, you can uh, process uh, level one to level two and then use uh, these coefficients to uh, get chlorophyll concentration based on new satellite data. So that is basically uh, the flowchart of how we would work with this data. Um, here again, the goal was to demonstrate how CDAS and um, uh, remote sensing data can be used to 
look at a variety of properties and learn more about water quality. So this concludes the demonstration and I'm going to go back to the slides. Uh, so again, uh, we can't emphasize enough that this training demonstrated water quality data validation and algorithm generation using sample data and the results presented are not, are not statistically significant. In practice, many more observations spanning multiple seasons are required for the validation and algorithm generation from remote sensing and in situ data. The example is given here for Gulf of Mexico, how many points there are um, in situ to actually validate the data. So you do need um, sufficient number of data. Um, so to summarize what we learned in this webinar, uh, we primarily focused on acquisition of available in situ data uh, from CBAS and MODIS and WIRS images. As we mentioned, CBAS is a global data set. Uh, we focused on Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we also learned about preparation of in situ data in CBAS format, which is CDAS readable. So any independent data we want to work with CDAS in CDAS, then they have to be in that format. We learned about CDAS features, um, open end display, level 2 data, mosaic satellite images, import in situ data along with satellite images, uh, correlate in situ and satellite based chlorophyll A data. Uh, we also learned how to reproject data. Re learning OCSSW today, uh, we focused on generating level 2 data from level 1. Uh, we demonstrated MODIS images, but the same can be done with WIRS. Uh, get familiar with different processing options. Uh, generate chlorophyll coefficients using level 2 water living reflectance from MODIS and WIRS. And then we had that procedure where we fitted the polynomial and got coefficients. So that's, that's what we did today. Here's some useful information. Uh, for cloud-free image search, you can use NASA Worldview and NOAA Ocean Color page. Uh, to find satellite overpass over a region of interest, there is an overpass predictor available in NASA Ocean Color web so that you can coincide in situ and satellite data for validation and for algorithm generation. Uh, for questions about CDAS and OCSSW, satellite data and processing, there is Ocean Color Forum where uh, already there are many questions and answers from which you can benefit or you can post your own, own question there too. Uh, finally, we want to live with a couple of future missions or upcoming missions which will focus on uh, water quality. PACE is Plankton Aerosol Cloud uh, ocean ecosystem mission and it's a plan to be launched uh, sometimes next year or so. Uh, it will carry ocean color instrument. It's a spectrometer uh, taking hyperspectral measurements in uh, 350 to 885 nanometer and it has the uh, wavelength range and it is at 5 nanometer interval so it's pretty hyperspectral. Uh, PACE's hyperspectral coverage will provide measurements um, to identify phytoplankton community composition. It is designed to improve our understanding of Earth's changing uh, marine ecosystems, and manage natural resources, fisheries, and identify harmful algal bloom. Just an example shown here that um, it, what PACE can see and what weirs can see. So that's the difference because of uh, uh, hyperspectral data this is the algal and non-algal um, particles that PACE will see and this is what WIR sees currently. So there is more information uh, in this wavelength range. Uh, next mission, which is uh, surface biology and geology mission, it's currently in its design phase and it's planned to launch 2026 or beyond. Uh, it, current plans are for hyperspectral imagery in the visible and shortwave infrared and multi or hyperspectral imagery in the thermal IR. And in its uh, observing priorities, inland and coastal aquatic ecosystem, 
physiology, uh, functional traits and health. It's one of the top priority uh, observable in here. So this concludes our, our webinar and we want to acknowledge uh, and thank our CEDAS team, um, Ainur Ab Abdul Razik, uh, Daniel Knowles, Sean Bailey and Yang Bing. They've helped um, a lot and guided us through many questions related to uh, CDAS and OCSSW. Uh, we also want to acknowledge the help we received from NASA Ocean Color Forum. And uh, I especially want to thank uh, Sean McCartney and Selwyn Hudson Odoi from RSET for their efforts in uh, documenting the procedures for CDAS and OCSSW installation on Mac and Windows uh, and how to configure virtual machine for Windows. Uh, computers. So uh, that ends uh, today's uh, presentation and demonstration and now it is lab time. So you have exercise two. Uh, the first two part are basically comparison of um, in situ and remote sensing data and generating level two data. But the last part is optional but that is the one that generates coefficient so you can do it. Um, um, it's a long exercise so it may not uh, be finished today but you have time to work on it and your homework also will have questions based on exercise one and exercise two so it's important to work through all those steps and get um, images that you will be submitting for your homework so thank you So uh, first question is, can someone help with the virtual machine installation? I am stuck at the line to install PEEP. And um, answer is, if you're having difficulties installing PEEP, you can try this following command. Um, either Salvin or Daniel or Bing, Sean, any of you have more insight into this, please go ahead and, and share your answer. This is question one. Hey, Amita, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, with this, you, you shouldn't be having too many issues, but um, this is just another alternative command you can use within Terminal and Ubuntu to install Python pip. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't work, you could also try um, Google searching the problem as well and seeing what other alternative answers you can find to this question? Okay, sounds good. And the, there is a lot of um, um, discussion, um, you know, um, install the PIP request on the forum. So, yeah. And then the PIP, yeah, if you want to do the uh, install PIP, uh, you can Google it, you know. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Bing. I think. Uh, Ocean Color Forum has a lot of information. Sometimes you um, same issues are faced by other people, and um, you, you find answers just by looking at uh, Ocean Forum, Ocean Color Forum. So, question two is the in situ data values vary quite a bit from the remote data sets in the table we were shown. I understand that the values may vary, but the difference in values were almost twice or higher. What do you make of that? And um, as we talked about it, um, it's not really surprising when you compare in situ data with satellite data because the scales are different. Uh, you have point measurements of water samples from which uh, uh, water quality parameters are derived in in situ data and uh, MODIS and VIRS are uh, um, almost a kilometer box that's um, and so you were comparing um, averaged or area average value with a single point value and um, so uh, uh, basically that's why um, it's important to look at large number of in situ data coincident with satellite data so you can uh, understand statistically what the uh, uh, differences are and then adjust your remote sensing data according to that. Um, 
if you, you might want to look at uh, this website here um, where um, you might find some insight and there are a lot of research papers regionally how they are removing bias in remote sensing data they you can find those as well online um, if anything uh, you want to add uh, CDAS team please go ahead and uh, add to this question answer uh, yeah th this is probably a good point to bring up <clears throat> two issues that I wanted to bring up anyway um, um, so we, we don't want to um, make any judgments about satellite data based on in situ measurements, especially um, not only single in situ measurements, but in situ measurements which are coastal, because that's very um, um, turbid mixed data. Um, ideally, you want to, if you want to validate satellite measurements, you want homogeneous uh, water, and so you want to do that a little more offshore or pixel to pixel. It's not going to um, be varying in a um, predictable way. It'd be more random. And, and so at that point, you know, if you if you get measurements more offshore and then you use those to compare the satellite data, then you then um, you know over a large amount of measurements as well, you can uh, start um, seeing that the satellite data uh, matches up better than you would see in a, um, a very turbid uh, coastal region. The, and um, some of the issues in the coastal region is, um, you know, whether you're actually seeing the uh, surface of the, um, the, the um, lake bed or wherever you're measuring as well. Because if you're taking measurements of the water, but you can see the, uh, uh, you know, if you can see down and see the surface, then the, the satellite data is, you know, not going to match. So. Um, there's a lot of issues with the, the uh, coastal data um, in that um, you, you, you basically have to anticipate that it, uh, you know, that, that these factors um, will be in there. Um, and um, then there's also a pixel size. Um, there's two issues with pixel size. One is whether the satellite was looking at nadir like straight down or whether the optical angle was very large um, what if you're looking at the nasa uh, world view and you see that you're using a, a level two file or a um, you know sa satellite data where the the location that you're interested in is way out on the edge then those pixels aren't going to be one kilometer by one kilometer if it's modus it'll be more like two kilometer by five kilometer they're like huge because of your your op optical angle one of the ways to um, reduce that is you can of course you know look at you know you can pick your um, scenes accordingly one one scene at a time look at it at the, when I say seeing the satellite scene, and if it's way out on the edge of the level two file, then you can decide whether you wanna use that or not, because it will be a big pixel. And that um, is shown up, if you do uh, the processing of level two, that's the sat zen that, that Amita showed, where it's set at 60, so you could reduce that to something more, um, conducive to in situ comparisons, which would be like a 40 degrees. So that way it reduces the allowed um, um, angles. Um, the other thing with pixel size is um, um, we've been looking at mosaic here. And when you mosaic by its very nature, your pixel size just grew um, larger because the pixels of the instrument are actually angled as the detector it's like a projection of the detector on the ground. Um, but if you, you know, when you map it onto the ground, then then you change the, basically the shape of every pixel on the ground will be the same. And so you're gonna map, map pixels into um, earth-based pixels. And so then you, you basically uh, get into situations where you're, it, it's, it's less reliable. Like you wouldn't really want to use mosaic for comparison with, uh, I mean, if you really want to get the best data possible, you want to use uh, the direct source level two file because it's still at the detector resolution. You haven't remapped it. And that's your best chance of getting your best comparison. So 
you know, th those are the two things that are, you know, just to keep in mind about satellite data that the, uh, the, um, that the, uh, you know, the homogeneousness of the water, you know, and, and also the pixel size. Thank you so much. Both of these points are excellent and uh, we specifically didn't mention, uh, but this, uh, comparing uh, with smaller zenith or almost nadir, that would be one way to validate data. Um, if, you, if you look at your exercise, um, and if you look at uh, part three of exercise, we are not mosaicing for that reason. Also, we have chosen now area which is right around where we have in situ data, but we haven't considered um, satellite zenith angle in this comparison that we're doing. But that's a great point. We uh, for actually validating um, that's one thing uh, zenith angle and then um, w one question is that if you have um, satellite data matching well in open ocean or homogeneous uh, region um, would you would you assume that it, it's okay in coastal region also that um, so Validation has to be done more away from coastal region and then um, sort of assume that what you see there, if, if that's good comparison, then you can extend that to coastal region. You assume that it, the accuracy must be uh, close. Is, is that a valid assumption or because of um, if the shallow water and turbid water, if you're looking satellite uh, is influenced by bottom reflection, then you might get um, not very accurate answers, right, Danny? I, I mean, it, it's, it's good at understanding water, um, but as, as you get close to the uh, shoreline, you've got the, um, um, you know, the, the stray light coming off of um, the, the, the coast. There's a lot of aerosols, as you noted, uh, different um, atmospheric issues going on as well as the more turbid water, all kinds of other factors are going on. And, you know, these equations, um, you know, are based on, on, on water and try to reduce all this. But so, um, you know, it, it, the, the coastal, you know, processing gets more challenging, to, but, uh, but you do want to validate that, you know, when, when you measure water, that, you know, it matches, you know, the, the, I mean, it's the same algorithm that you're applying essentially to the basics of the, for chlorophyll, but then you're doing all that, you know, removal. So it's, um, yeah, basically it's tough to validate coastal water because of all the, um, mm -hmm. um, the issues, not to mention the, Vegas. Oh, one thing I wanted to add also, which might be helpful in the the, the, uh, cause the other point that I noticed um, about processing the whole world as an ocean to get rid of the land. Um, one thing to, to note that you, if you have a high resolution satellite data uh, currently and maybe for the foreseeable future, our landmass are one kilometer data that inside there. So um, that's the data that's stored. So if you have a high resolution satellite like uh, Landsat or even VIRS slightly higher or Sentinel-3 if you get to 250, something like that, then if you're using the, the landmass, you're, you're, you're knocking off one kilometer blocks and so you're losing data. So by processing the ocean that the world as ocean basically ignoring the land you get all this data but then you still have land so one way to then subsequently get rid of the land at a higher resolution is cdas has a, a land mask processing tool which you can set at a higher resolution so so then you can mask out the land subsequently at higher resolution which can be helpful because then you can get some of these pixels that were masked out as land back because they actually weren't land at high resolution. Yeah, great point, thank you. There is a um, SRTM based land mask available also, which is 30 meters. So yeah, that is useful for masking land. Um, 
So question three is, um, is the L1B the file that we should use for L1B processing? No, for L1B processing, inputs are L1A and GO files. One thing that's helpful, every processor has its own name, but in general, if something's called level two, Jen, it's it's what the output file is. So level one B, you're creating a level one B. So question four is when we have many in situ data points, how do we match them in CDAS with satellite images? The demo gave, given was for a single file. If we have many files, do we do it manually or is there an automated way of doing it? So my experience working with CDAS, uh, what I showed I actually did manually uh, compared image by image and then made that Excel file. Uh, when we use command line, uh, we can process many images at a time, but um, Danny, you might have a better uh, insight into that or suggestion for that. Hmm. Well, I mean, you have, I mean, not, not offhand, there, there, there is, there are, there are some tools in there. I think there's a pixel extract tool. So, um, that might be used. You would have to, you know, process, you, you would need to learn the GPT, uh, mm -hmm. aspect of CDAS. Um, so I, I haven't explored that a, as much. I mean, see that, but 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 if you can figure out how, obviously, if if you need the GUI to do it, then you can't do it this way because the GUI is one by one kind of. But if you can figure out a processing way that that you could run something from the command line and tell CDS to do what you want from the command line, then you can loop through files. Um, yeah, so working with GUI, I think um, work with a single file and then extract data, which is basically what we did when we created that Excel file for multiple days. Um, it gets tricky if you have 100 days or a season like a, or one or annual data, one year worth of data, then it helps to go to command line and uh, use GPT to do that. Okay, uh, question five is, could you talk more about the SBG inland water mission? Are these ocean pro, uh, pro procedures amenable to working in fresh waters? So um, um, I don't have exact answer for that. Um, a lot of these sensors are used for inland monitoring, uh, fresh water monitoring also, uh, but we will uh, find out precise answer and let you know. Question six is, do you have any idea when OCSSW will be integrated in the CDAS for Windows? Uh, I think we'll have to look to the CDAS team to answer that question. Yeah, OCSSW is available for Windows right now. Sorry? Uh, what the question is when the OCS is now will be available in Windows. Is that the question? Yes. It, it, when it, when will it be integrated in the CDAS for Windows? Um, so right now, uh, I think you have to install OCSSW in in um, virtual machine. Is there any way that step can be eliminated? I think that is the question here. Oh, okay. Um, I don't think so, uh, because OCSW is developed in uh, C++ and C and, and other Python, like multiple languages. Um, mm -hmm. It cannot run on Windows in the native environment. Okay. Uh, so it can only run on Linux environment. Um, mm -hmm. That's why we have installed, you know, the Windows Linux subsystem, Windows, Windows subsystem, Linux, or uh, you know, you have to have virtual machines that you can install in the uh, Linux environment. Um, uh, yeah. Um, I don't, question. As I, I don't do plan to have a like executable OCSW on 
Mm. I mean, right. So, um, you know, if if you look at ocean color form, you also might uh, find some uh, answers to, I mean, not answers, but solutions to uh, some of these uh, problems that uh, how to in Inspiration part, um, this is W, um, because it's intuitive into CDES, because you can access SSW from the CDES application. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, question seven is during exercise one, after step three of creating land masks, I'm not able to add the vector file of CBAS. While adding the set file, it does not properly show the location on the map. How do I add the CBAS file? So uh, basically, uh, uh, you, you have to select the image you want to put uh, CBAS on, and then um, import data from file, uh, in vector, import vector CBAS. Um, and as we saw in several cases, that's the way you just get import the CBAS file. So not sure what the problem you might be having. Um, you do have to select an image on which you want to put this data. That's for sure. I would but, suggest if you're having problems like something like this to make, the, essentially make what your problem is into step one. Um, so you don't do all this other stuff and find a single file, open that file make sure that that file contains the coordinates like of your um, CBAS file so that way you know that the, the lat lawn would fall in there and then just you know do what um, Amita said the, the open the, the chlorophyll or one of the bands of that and then import the CBAS data that way you're not doing other things that way you just, just see how it works and it should automatically be selected. There's a toggle in the layer manager to toggle it on and off. But um, when you do import a CBAS uh, vector, it will be toggled on to begin with. So the question eight is, can we process Sentinel uh, based data on CDAS? If so, are these steps going to be the same as Moody's or Rears? Any suggestions? Um, I have used, uh, I don't think through GUI you have um, MSI. I think OLCHI was going to be added, but um, through CDAS GUI, um, if you look at OCSSW, uh, you don't see uh, Sentinel sensors in there through GUI. But in command line, of course, you can use uh, Sentinel data with uh, with OCSSW. And once you, uh, you can display, if you have a product derived from OCSSW in command line um, for Sentinel, those data can be imported into CDAS to visualize and analyze. But for generating um, level two data in, in through GUI, uh, I don't think it's it's possible yet. Um, to, to, for Ulchi, uh, you, you need to install the, the processors for it, so that needs to be done at the command line. But I believe once that you've at the command line made it operational, so it will process, then I believe you should be able to process to use the GUI to process Sentinel data. Um, yeah, Olchi. I think uh, there is a there is an Olchi um, tool uh, in the new version of CDAS, but I have not tried that. I uh, for Sentinel, so I'll have to check. Yeah, and this is beyond the the topic of, of C, but CDAS also is essentially a Snap as well, and Sentinel Snap was built for Sentinel, so we're not addressing any of their processors, but they have their own. Um, set of processors i believe somewhere um in in the in there or that data but it's it's separate and it's specific to sentinel 3. so question nine is there are four cbus data points in the file but the correlative plot shows only two why so there there can be two reasons one is in one of the files you can see that uh, 
data are at the same location. There are two points, but at same coordinate. And so when it displays, it displays as one point. Ideally, you would average that uh, uh, those two points and make one point. So that's one reason. Another reason is um, there's no uh, satellite data available. Maybe it's in that, that coastal zone where it was masked as land. So there, there's no remote sensing data available. So then that point will not be displayed on your correlative plot. So uh, uh, when when we masked all the coastal uh, region as ocean, um, in the second part, you we, we increase those points because satellite data were available there. So these two reasons can be there. Well, one of the things with CBAS data, depending on how it was measured, they can measure it over a period of time. They can move around from station to station and actually return to a station. So if you yeah. have if you have two points of data that are at the same station, but they could be drastically different by days and time. And so you may want to um, um, ide ideally, if you're um, you you want to edit your CBAS files, make a copy of them, edit them down to be matching up with your uh, satellite data so they don't contain points that are away from the time of your satellite data or the day of your satellite data. And that's easy to do because the CBAS files are text files. So you can just make a copy of that file, edit out just the lines that you want, keep them in it, and then load that file in instead of the whole CBAS file. Yeah, so uh, for GQOS data, we were able to pick, um, because they were high resolution data, and we were able to pick points which were close to satellite uh, overpass or, or revisit time. Uh, for CBAS, we just uh, followed the date. Um, and last time, as uh, Daniel mentioned, ideal window for, for comparison would be plus minus three hours. Uh, of in so they are within that period, satellite data and in situ data. That's that's good. Uh, in, in a day, a lot of things can change. But for understanding the procedure, we just went ahead and selected days rather than day and time. There's, there's one other thing, and I don't remember all the terminology of it um, that the CBAS folks do, but they they have your base. In, in the CBAS files, They there's a depth to it. So, you know, you, you're measuring at a certain depth, but they they also sometimes will make files where they they adjust the depth to be at the surface. So they use certain uh, equations to bring bring it up to the surface. So to to so that, so those would be closer to what the satellite might see. And I can't tell you how they do it or any of the equations on it, but but just keep in mind that. Some of these measurements are, are not at the surface of the water, they're down below. Yeah, so CBAS has that information, what depth, uh, and you can choose uh, at what depth you want the data. Uh, that, that is one of the options. Um, okay. Question 10 is, I'm currently stuck at providing a proper link for Python 3. Could you please advise what should I provide to SUDO so that this command works? I think Selvin or Sean, I think this is your question. You might want to talk to your system admin um, uh, because they they might know your machine better. Um, yeah, so that's what we suggest. <laughs> you know, we're not your system admin, basically. Question 11, when I'm calibrating rears, I get the following error, execution exception, Java IO exception, calibrate rears failed with exit code one. Uh, wh why is this happening? I think we'll have to check. Um, I'm not sure what the error means. Because obviously I didn't get that. Uh, and so I, I will have to go back and see what that means. Has it something to do with Java? I'm not sure. Uh, 
what is the concept of taking logarithmic values while calculating and comparing coefficient values um, so if you if you look at the plot uh, relationship it, it's um, either you can so when you find when you find uh, look at log of chlorophyll and log of reflectance ratio they have that relationship uh, that we saw so that's why we are taking that logarithmic value so when you you get the answer from coefficients it's log 10 of chlorophyll so you have to take exponential of that to get actual chlorophyll value in milligrams per meter cube Question 13 is also similar to question 11. Uh, it has execution exception with Java IO. So it, it looks like that could be something with Java version on your machine. Uh, I think this is, uh, if it's like execution exception, usually it's something was wrong on the server side or the OCSW ex execution. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, just uh, something was wrong if the execution it didn't complete and that's why it gives this exception here so we have to check uh, what was the parameters and what was the message from the OCSSW execution uh, but uh, we will try to provide a better message than this one the, this is um, maybe this is not really helpful for the end users so we will try to give another um, better descriptive message what's wrong but um, but you need to give us other than this message. There will there will be something. You know what was the you to return uh, string from the server side? Okay. Yeah. So if there's any additional information you can provide, that would help. Yeah. This will, basically this is more like the execution on the server side was ex the execution. For example, most of the time if you repeat the same command, you were trying to execute on the OCSW from the command line. Uh, mm -hmm. that it, it will not complete. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we can look through this further and provide more. You can send us a screenshot. What was the whole message? Great. Also, um, is he trying to run uh, Modus L1B from uh, in Modus L1A file plus a geo file, or what? What is anything to do with Modus L2 data? I I don't really understand. What is he trying to do? Yeah, it, it to me it looks like uh, trying to run level two from level one B. Um, has this oh. but but the exception says modus l1b failed so it looks yeah. like he's running a modus l1b okay yeah right well, l1b right. does have l2 as a input my guess was that this was his tar target ultimately down the chain he wanted to get to level two but if that's not the case then bing's right that the inputs to level 1b are level 1a and a geophile Right. Level right. two comes much later. The level one B then serves as an input to the level two gen, which will then create the level two alongside a geophile again as inputs. If you look at the exercise, all these steps are, are given, uh, which files are input for which processing. So carefully, if you follow the steps, um, you at least that part uh, can be taken care of. Yeah, and there is also a, um, a menu help um, page online, uh, cds.gsfc.nasa.gov slash help. So it'll, you know, like, a, it'll show you what, what input, uh, you know, for each process, so what's the input and the output. Okay, I think I'm just going to put the 
Yeah, I put the link in the chat. Oh, okay. Great, thank you. So you can check this link for more help. Um, I think exercise two will take some time to finish. And so you have um, to 5th of January to finish both the exercises. And it looks like uh, based on your own computers systems, it you might have some issues, but you can uh, contact uh, NASA Ocean Color Forum. They, there you will find uh, more expert answers about CDAS and OCSSW. Um, you can always contact us and we can talk to CDAS team, but usually through Ocean Color Forum, uh, you can get the same um, access to same CDAS team, I believe. Um, so it's almost noon here. And um, if you don't have any more questions, we want to thank you for attending uh, this webinar uh, series. And hopefully, um, at least it, it gives you idea of complexity and still usefulness of some of these tools uh, to learn more about water quality based on sensing. So we will uh, close the series soon. Um, you will receive a survey uh, in, in a day or two. Uh, which asks for your feedback about the training. And it's very important for us to get the survey back and your feedback about how we can improve or what uh, other topics you're interested in. So please take a few moments to uh, finish the survey when you receive the link. Um, and you can finish, uh, homework is posted online also. Um, so you can work on homework between now and 5th of January. Um, so if there are no more questions, we want to thank you for attending. Uh, we want to thank entire CDAS team, uh, Ainur, Bing, and Daniel. Uh, you've been great help uh, and, uh, in answering all these questions. Um, and then I also want to thank uh, our RSET colleagues who helped us in organizing uh, this, this webinar. So in addition to Sean McCartney and uh, Sabine Atsan Hodoy, uh, we had help from um, Brock Blevins, Sarah Kachel, and Jonathan O'Brien. Uh, so thank you, our team, for your help. And thanks, everyone, for attending this webinar. We hope to see you in our future webinar soon. It's almost here now, so wishing you happy holidays and happy new year in advance.